All right, guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. You know, I think I feel the same way as XRP Crypto Wolf here. Honestly, I haven't seen this many frustrated XRP holders in forever, so we definitely got to be close to finally going to the moon. We are all going together, says Khan. Uh, Alex down here saying, you know, you're not going to the moon alone. I will be right behind you, brother. So some positive messages here, too, from the XRP community. But Politico Politico here saying, you know, it will never moon. People are sick of this scam coin. And I feel like, you know, this is what people are. You know, it's, it's funny how people's sentiment shifts. I've been in this space for a while and I know XRP has not had a lack of disappointment. However, when it does pump, it really does move. And this is why, uh, you know, on this channel, we look at the historical chart patterns and, uh, you know, see what we can glean from that for the coming bull run. Now, XRP right now is trading at about 56.9. It has moved up a little bit. This is XRP on the hourly. As you guys can see within the last uh, hour or so, if I get rid of uh, that last candlestick there, that last wick there, you guys can see it has moved up a little bit. So, I mean, you know, this is because the overall crypto market is moving up. Nick Crusader here also noticing the same trend for uh, XRP holders who are probably very, very frustrated. It is peak frustration. I have been loving it but the crying is getting beyond ridiculous. No one is forcing anyone to buy and hold XRP in your portfolio. You can simply sell and move on. And, uh, you know, I feel like so many people are, uh, you know, already in it that uh, selling at this point would, uh, even they know deep down inside, no matter how much they are whining, complaining, and crying, they also know deep down that uh, what could occur is once they sell, XRP does finally pop to that next level. I mean, you cannot deny this bullish Nike swoosh pattern that we're seeing here on the chart. Nick goes on to say here, I make XRP videos every single day because I believe in the long-term vision of our settlement layers ushering in the future. The second we have instant settlements, payments are now in the future. Also remember, instant settlement removes the need for a reserve currency. So Ripple has been doing a lot of that work in the back end. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that sometimes we talk about, sometimes we glaze over, but you know, it's not uh, the sexy stuff. It's the hard work performed by the developers that is, uh, you know, adding to the XRP ecosystem that is going to create more demand for XRP long term. He also says this, I also believe that Ripple stands at the forefront of the convergence of our monetary system with DLT and blockchain. Ripple has been building, expanding and becoming a dominant force for over a decade now. They have ties with the IMF, the World Bank, the BIS, the FSB and various other major organizations. I should also mention that they have been in discussion with 20 to 30 central banks regarding CBDC sees not to mention all their partnerships with uh 50 plus central banks so xrp trading just under 60 cents very very temporary we also have to remember here guys that bitcoin is also set to make new highs here uh maybe not right this second but it is set to move up you can see a bit of a pop for the bitcoin price that's why we saw xrp earlier gain some steam to just under 60 cents so bitcoin has now uh, surpassed that 0.618 here on the hourly I really do wonder what's going to happen, though, when it gets back to the 702. Are we going to make new highs? And I mean, even to the point 786, uh, you know, basically, Bitcoin is still underneath that high. There is the looming Bitcoin ETF that is playing uh, pretty much playing into this narrative uh, 100%. I think we're only seeing this Bitcoin price move because of the ETF news. As you guys can see, though, greed has dipped down a little bit. The market is, uh, well, it's in green right now over the last 24 hours. Uh, most of the market is seeing some green, uh, except for a few altcoins. And our portfolios, I mean, guys, they're going to fluctuate in the meantime. This is part of a bull run. If this is your very first bull run, learn from me. Your portfolio is going to fluctuate. It's not going to go straight up in the air. You're going to see ups. You're going to see downs. Uh, but, you know, we got to follow the news. We got to follow the trends. And so I happen to notice this, too. When you look up the term BTC ETF here, OK, and I'm looking for the uh, for the trends in the United States, because this is where the Bitcoin ETF is being issued. You can see check out this surge. OK, I've got it on the last 12 months. But if I throw this on uh, the past 30 days, you can see over the last uh, month, you can see the trend numbers since January the 1st has gone up significantly. So uh, as of January the 5th, which was only a couple of days ago, that would be Friday. Uh, it was at 100. So. Uh, since then, it has tapered off a little bit. But guys, this is what's getting Bitcoin price really, really moving. So now it's a question of when. And so uh, we've got some inclination as to when. On Wednesday, BlackRock is expecting approval from the Securities and Exchange Commission for its new Bitcoin spot ETF. 
Uh, the first time a crypto investment product tracking the daily price of the world's most popular digital coin will be approved by the SEC regulators to trade on a public stock market. Other asset managers are also expecting approval for their ETF. So this was uh, courtesy of Eleanor Turret here, uh, retweeting out Charles Gasparino's tweet originally. BlackRock to cut 3% of its workforce as firm expects the SEC approval for its Bitcoin ETF on Wednesday. So that is in three days, guys, three days that uh, they are expecting, at least that they are reporting, that they are expecting this Bitcoin ETF. And maybe, uh, you know, based on this news, this is why we're seeing the price of Bitcoin start moving back up. For my Patreon subscribers, I will be letting everybody over there know when I'm going to be making some moves. If I'm going to be making some moves again, the timing has got to be right. I'm not jumping in uh, chasing green candlesticks. I've made a concerted effort to uh, really kind of minimize my FOMO levels so I can maximize my profit taking potential. So uh, if that's something you guys are interested in, want to see what I'm trading this bull run, patreon.com slash working money channel. You can find it all there. Some have been critical about this Bitcoin ETF like Max Kaiser. When you buy any of the Bitcoin ETFs, you're buying into an index product that tracks the price. You don't actually own BTC. He mentions down here, uh, the Fidelity BTC ETF will custody the BTC at Fidelity and not Coinbase, but that doesn't mean you actually own the BTC. You don't. Uh, and Jonathan Globerman uh, here saying this is actually factually incorrect. Max Kaiser arguing this is factually correct. Read the prospectus. Misinformation says nothing unreal exists. Max Kaiser responding cringe. This is wrong, says Spice Latte. Max Kaiser responding cope. So Max Kaiser defending his point here, although uh, he is in fact, uh, well, kind of correct, kind of not correct. Fred Krueger here. Uh, trying to clear this up a little bit. Anybody who claims not your keys, not your Bitcoin should read this. If you own the spot ETF, you own the Bitcoin. So he was retweeting out Eric Malchunas' tweet, which basically reads this. ETFs are depository receipts. This is what SPDR stands for, S&P Depository Receipt. So you do actually own the BTC or the underlying asset the, that the ETF tracks. Your shares, aka receipts, linked to the proportional BTC that has been deposited with a custodian. This is why ETFs are SBF proof. Now, it is true that when you sell, you can't get BTC back, but no one who would use an ETF wants BTC back. They'd rather have USD. That's the whole point of the fund in general, uh, to outsource all this to someone else. Fund investors have no interest in direct ownership. If they did, they would DIY. So uh, Eric Balchun is giving us a bit of a 101 on a Bitcoin ETF. And so Fred Krueger here uh, clarifying too, the OG Maxi propaganda handbook needs to be updated. Lyle Pratt saying, you may own it from a legal standpoint, but you don't actually have control over it. No guarantees over whether or not you eventually get it. And uh, Fred Krueger responding, except owning it from a legal standpoint is pretty darn important, especially if it ends up being one of the largest, most liquid ETFs in the world. So technically you do own the Bitcoin, but you do not have control over it. I get what Max Kaiser is saying here, but I also uh, understand this point too. I know some people have been asking me uh, if I would personally purchase the Bitcoin ETF uh, when it does come out. And uh, to be honest with you, I do already hold a Bitcoin spot traded product in my retirement account. So uh, I guess the answer is yes there. It's just because I wanted to have exposure to Bitcoin in my retirement account because I know historically the volatility has worked to my favor. Uh, blockchain backer here commenting on something else Bitcoin related. The $1.2 million in Bitcoin that got deposited into Satoshi's wallet this week has a smell to it. So I don't know if you guys heard this news. Either Satoshi woke up, bought 27 Bitcoin from Binance and then deposited it into his wallet or someone just burned a million dollars. 1.2 million USD uh, worth of Bitcoin was deposited in the Satoshi Nakamoto wallet this past week. The week before the ETF announcements, kind of like, remember this guy and all the Bitcoin he owns, and it's not disclosed who he is? Well, 1.2 million, the timing seems like foreshadowing, and that is odd. It does seem a little odd, doesn't it? Jeremy Hogan also commenting on this. Somebody just sent Satoshi's Genesis wallet 1.2 million in Bitcoin. Why? The only thing that makes any sense here is that the sender is flushing Satoshi out. Now, Digital Asset Investor also commented on this, uh, suggesting the same kind of thing. The elephant in the room, there is no Bitcoin ETF if they don't know who Satoshi is. They've always known. Biggest lie in financial history next to ETHgate, of course. So what they are suggesting is... Uh, in order to get these uh, Bitcoin ETFs approved, obviously they cannot, uh, you know, approve a Bitcoin ETF if the largest holder of Bitcoin is still an unknown entity. So based on the new rules that uh, you now have to report to the IRS, any transaction of crypto above a certain amount, well now technically Satoshi Nakamoto, I guess if he is American, 
technically does have to report this to the IRS. Well, under the new IRS rules, you have to report any receipt of crypto over 10K. So Satoshi has to dox himself or break the law. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe there is still some mystery to Satoshi Nakamoto's identity. And maybe this is why they are. Uh, but may, who's doing this? I don't know. But maybe this is why whoever is doing this is doing this. Maybe it is a government transaction, a regulator transaction, an SEC transaction. I don't know. But it does beg some more questions. Jeremy Hogan saying, but why almost 1.2 million? That's a very good point. Uh, so it can't be argued that he failed to notice the transfer. You might miss uh, 0.2 Bitcoin, but over 26 Bitcoin? No way. Okay, not the best argument, but I'm intrigued. What the heck? As the kids say, XRP Crypto Wolf responding here, or maybe Bitcoin Maxi just being dumb and sent Bitcoin by accident. It is possible. Uh, but, you know, this theory does sound uh, very, very probable. You cannot, uh, you cannot approve a Bitcoin ETF without knowing who the largest holder of Bitcoin is. And, uh, you know, since there's been a lot of interest in this, since Satoshi Nakamoto's identity is still technically a mystery, even though we uh, might have some inclination who Satoshi Nakamoto is. If you guys didn't catch the video I did on that months ago, I will link it up here in the top right hand corner. Guys, all things are looking to fall in line. Bitcoin price is reacting to, uh, you know, this looming Bitcoin ETF approval. And even Jay Clayton is saying he believes the approval is inevitable. Really? So it seems like there's kind of short term pressure on the SEC in terms of the, the huge run up in Bitcoin and the idea that if they don't approve this now, after all this expectation, a lot of people are going to lose their shirts in, in the Bitcoin markets. But there's also this sort of long term concern about investor protection, right? Because if you talk about people investing their retirement funds now in a Bitcoin ETF and Bitcoin has been such a wildly volatile item uh, out there, you see these huge epic swings that you don't see in other asset classes, you talk about people maybe losing their retirement funds in the long run. So how do you balance those two things as the SEC looking at this, you know, on a Friday night in early January? Well, Layman, let me let me talk about the SEC's role here. And what I would say is the three things the SEC felt that they had to get right before they approve it. And, you know, approval is not certain, but I've said that you know, approval this week is not certain, but I believe approval eventually is inevitable. It feels uh, like it's they coming, have to get right? right. They, they, yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Or that, the disclosure has to be right, okay, so that people understand what they're buying. The second thing is the underlying trading market has to be efficacious. It has to be of of a quality that manipulation, the type of um, you know just bad behavior that you don't want to see in an underlying trading market is eliminated or at an acceptable minimum. Um, and then lastly, and this is very important here with with a digital asset, the pipes have to work. The product itself, the custody, the create, the redemption. Kate talked about authorized participants and the arbitrage and, and how this product actually functions. That has to work. So the SEC has to have gotten comfortable that all those things are, are going to function as they should. Um, and I've said many times when I was chair of the SEC, I was concerned about that underlying Bitcoin trading market. So, um, yeah. you know, I think we've gotten past it. On your question about investors, I rarely give investment advice. I don't know whether Bitcoin's going to be worth a lot or a little. I will say this. This is a speculative, volatile asset. No good investment advisor or broker dealer would tell you to put a substantial portion of your investment assets into a single volatile or speculative asset. You what say that. Jay, I'm sorry to interrupt. You say that, but somebody will, right? I mean, somebody out there in the financial advisory world will say, you know what? You want to make some money in your retirement funds? Get into this. It's, it's going to expand. And somebody's going to lose their shirt, right? I mean, that's just the nature well, I mean, of the I mean, Let me just say this. I, I, I would hope that no broker dealer or investment advisor registered with the SEC would tell somebody to put all their chips in the Bitcoin basket. That's what Jay Clayton's saying. Uh, you know, the answer of a politician, the answer of a lawyer, however you want to slice it, uh, not really giving us too much, but saying that the approval is inevitable. And also saying, you know, he was concerned about the underlying Bitcoin trading market. But uh, since he was uh, the head commissioner of the SEC, he, he says, I think we have gotten past that. Now, what does that mean, really? Who is controlling Bitcoin? It's obviously no longer retail. Institutions maybe have taken the reins, according to Jay Clayton. Things that make you go, hmm. The proposition of an XRP ETF is becoming more and more of a reality too, guys. This one, courtesy of Michael Branch on Twitter, the sixth largest cryptocurrency by market cap, XRP, may likely see the launch of an exchange-traded fund this year and an application as early as the next few months. 
So guys, this was a development by uh, crypto influencer Ben Armstrong, who hinted in a video about an upcoming XRP ETF. Armstrong said that he is acting on insider information. Well, Ben has said this in the past and he has been wrong. Uh, nevertheless, this is now what he is saying, and he's saying that it is said to come in April, so uh, likely by the end of the XRP lawsuit. We know those final dates are coming in April, I believe, April 29th, if I'm not mistaken, the same time the SEC versus Ripple lawsuit is scheduled to close. So with a spike of attention surrounding Bitcoin, the XRP army have argued that XRP deserves to get a similar ETF. Importantly, they emphasize that XRP is the only altcoin with legal clarity following the court's ruling last year that declared the digital asset a non-security. In yesterday's video, too, I did mention that uh, Grayscale has now uh, re-added XRP as part of their uh, basket of cryptocurrencies for one of their uh, cryptocurrency traded funds. If you guys didn't catch that video, I will link it up here in the top right-hand corner. A lot of uh, you know speculation now. Now that XRP has non-security status, it has now been in the sights of more regulators and uh, been added uh, for, in this example, to the Grayscale fund. I think the future for XRP is looking very bright in terms of the institutional adoption of, uh, you know, purely the trading of that particular cryptocurrency. You know, you take even just all the real world utility, put that aside, XRP, you know, there's a good case that XRP is going to rally just based on the utility. I mean, we don't know when that's going to happen, if it's five years from now, three years from now, seven years from now, but uh, the utility is going to build, the liquidity is going to build. But guys, even just from a pure speculative case, the price of XRP right now sitting very, very attractively down in and around 60 cents. And uh, again, just building up this base layer here, the Nike swoosh pattern. Again, all the noobs are crying, crying, crying. Why hasn't XRP mooned yet? But you know, I think it's only a matter of time. When we talk about the partnerships, I mean, Ripple Partners are really nailing it too. With regards to uh, this company, PhonePay, they just named Ripple Partner TerraPay veteran Ritesh Pay as their CEO. And I believe uh, PhonePay too is a, uh, is a Ripple partner. So two Ripple partners here. Now, uh, one of them is taking former TerraPay CEO as their CEO. India-based digital payments company PhonePay has appointed TerraPay's veteran Ritesh Pay as CEO of International Payments, saying he will lead the company's global expansion plans. Ritesh has been uh, an early believer and staunch supporter of the company and was very instrumental in the early days uh, of UPI, Unified Payment Interface, their success story. So PhonePay CEO and founder Samir Nigam uh, said in Friday in a press release, I'm delighted that he's joining us to lead our team for international growth plans. Pay was most recently president of the products and solutions at Ripple Partner TerraPay, according to a release. There, he was responsible for launching and implementing payment products and solutions globally. Before that, Pay served as a senior group president and chief digital officer at Yes Bank, where he led the bank's digital strategy and transformation and launched partnerships with fintech players. The release said, uh, as a leader in the digital payment sector, Pay has launched innovative solutions and structured business business deals and partnerships globally as per the release. And guys, just down here, here's another quote. I am excited to join PhonePay as it takes significant strides in shaping the future of digital payments on a global scale. Well, I mean, with uh, not only the experience, but the relationship with TerraPay, considering too that both these companies are Ripple partners, I think Pay could definitely bring a lot to the table here. PhonePay has achieved uh, market leadership in India. Uh, with its unwavering commitment to product innovation and building customer-centric solutions, I'm confident that the same focus will help us expand our footprint beyond national borders, taking our payment technology to an international audience. So a big partnership here. They have 500 million registered users and 37 million merchants across India. So you can just imagine uh, just the sheer volume of uh, payments that will be going through PhonePay in India, considering Ripple is already a household name in India too. I'm not surprised that they have now hired uh, a former CEO of another Ripple-enabled company. So big news there, guys, coming out of India. I also happen to see this from XRP Drops, Aaron Sears of Ripple. Okay, he was talking about uh, Brazil's regulatory market for cryptocurrencies in this report here. Five trends that will change the crypto market in 2024, according to experts. And if you go down here, uh, some of the headings include regulation, adoption by companies, uh, institutional investors. Okay. So the big money coming into the space, and this is where Sears chimes in. In addition to companies, institutional investors who have more capital and diverse portfolios should also increase their presence in the market of crypto assets. So guys, this coming from Ripple senior vice president saying more institutions are going to invest in cryptocurrencies. And remember that sticking point, the point that Ripple continuously hits home, there's only going to be a handful of digital assets that really succeed. 99% of cryptocurrencies are going to go away. So when you hear representatives from Ripple saying, you know, these kinds of statements, 
institutional money coming into crypto assets, diverse portfolios, you know, the big money, they're coming in. What coin do you think they're going to be investing in? In the case of Brazil, he states that following the future of regulation scheduled for mid-2024, we will see significant advances in institutional investments in the region, strengthening the legitimacy of the market. So this is uh, for Brazil specifically, driving further growth and creating new opportunities for startups and established players. Brazil's proactive approach to regulation is also likely to inspire other Latin American countries to develop their own regulatory frameworks, promoting regional collaboration to create a more cohesive market. This will benefit the entire Latin American region by enabling innovation to flourish, facilitating more efficient cross-border transactions and encouraging tokenization-based solutions across multiple sectors. So some encouraging words here from Aaron Sears of Ripple a proactive approach to Brazil's regulation and uh, regulatory clarity. And the fact that, yes, guys, more money is going to be flowing into this market. I'm hoping very, very soon. It never hurts that the XRP ledger has two special attributes, according to Quincy here. Now, Quincy's a very bright guy. He's a developer in the space. He's always been very, very bullish on XRP and the ecosystem that surrounds the XRP token, namely the XRP ledger. Here's what he said about the XRP decks in particular, putting it in a way that I think is going to make sense for many of us. Listen to this. A lot, of these other, a lot of the other things, are, there's a lot of overlap. And don't get me wrong, there are some things where it's not proof of stake or proof of work, but that's not what makes it special. That's what makes it maybe unique, but not what's special. The two things that make it special is one, the entire network is a debt. What does that mean? It means anybody from their individual wallet can list an asset for sale into the debt. You don't have to go to a debt. You don't have to go to third. The entire network is a debt. In that debt is a liquidity routing algorithm that allows you to maximize liquidity between any asset that you, or maximize the, Max, it, it automatically routes um, it automatically routes the asset to maximize liquidity. So the whole premise of this is no liquidity pools. There's an algorithm that keeps you so any any other exchange, any other dex, any other everything has liquidity pools. XRP does not. It has an algorithm that maximizes liquidity by being able to route um, by being able to route and um, liquidate the asset based on what's available on the network. Those are the two things that make XRP amazing. Now you can get into the speed, you can get into it's not proof of work, proof of stake, you can get into all that too. But those two things, the fact that the entire network's a debt and there's an algorithm that maximizes liquidity on that debt is the two biggest things. And when people talk about cross-border remittances, currency, no Shrevosho, that allows for the instant liquidity of any asset like it's cash. You see what I mean? So boom goes the dynamite. Providing instant liquidity on a decentralized exchange. You don't have to go to a third party, guys. It's all built in. And this coming from a developer, an XDC developer on top of that, Quincy here at Coin Club. Quincy wanted to thank Chad Steingraber and Quincy for giving his opinion on the XRPL, why it's special, why it's really about tokenizing everything, and why Ripple has such a vested interest in keeping this token liquid. They need it to be a high enough price in order to facilitate the types of things that they want to facilitate, guys. So 56 cents, if you're still crying over your investment, maybe it's time for you to sell your XRP and buy something else. Go chase some green candlesticks. That's certainly not what I'm going to be doing, but that's just my opinion. I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.